So I would like to talk about this, though, uh, tonight, about what we're going through and where Jesus is at in the middle of this. And, and um, so I was actually uh, reading, my, um, reading my devotionals a couple days ago, and I was trying to come up with something that I could send out to the guys that would be encouraging. And I was reading through... Uh, uh, what Jesus had to say something. Sometimes, you know, it's like we got we we were communicating with a young lady uh, uh, that we knew clear back in Ohio. I'm just going to back this up just a little bit. Clear back in Ohio, uh, and my wife has been communicating with her, and and uh, she uh, talking about different. Uh, beliefs that we had together growing up and then how that's kind of diverted since then. And um, she, was the, she was her Bible teacher at the church school. And um, anyway, what happens is, is uh, people go through uh, evolution of their doctrine based upon who they know and, and uh, circumstances. And, and so if you're not actually reading the Bible and finding out what God actually says about things, what Jesus says about things, you can think, and this, this happened to, to a pastor that we had, a um, pastor that we had up in Tulsa, uh, his father, uh, might have, was this his grandfather or his father? I think it was his grandfather. His grandfather passed away, and this man was not living for the Lord. And so um, he decided that, uh, that he was going to go to heaven anyway. And so he completely adjusted all his doctrine to say that God loves everybody, and so we're, everybody's going to heaven. Whether they choose Jesus or not, every grace covers everybody, so everybody's safe. Um, and if you were to read Jesus very much, he doesn't talk like that, does he? <laughs> he talks about hell. He talks about fire. He talks about destruction. And so, uh, I'm so thankful that that we can. We can get good things even though Jesus warned of perilous times. He warned, he didn't just say everything's going to be okay. And I, and I was reading, uh, another thing I was reading earlier was about um, out of Micah. And, you know, a big peeve that the, that the, that the prophets had, uh, there were schools of prophets. There were, um, there were whole groups of people that were designated to be prophets. It's a little different than we are today as much. You know, we have an in, inward witness of the Holy Spirit, so it doesn't have quite the function that it did back then, although I believe God still prophesies things. And there's still a place for that, amen? But uh, a big problem in the Old Testament when you're reading through that is that uh, prophets... <laughs> It, it, it was kind of like, um, uh, oh, what was an, I, I was given the illustration that the, donk, the, the talking donkey, you know, um, uh, Balak, right? or, yeah, Balak, um, you know, he was trying to be manipulated. He was one of the prophets. He was, they, they were trying to manipulate him to, to do something based upon their circumstances. They didn't even know God. And what, what did he have to do? He said, well, i got to say what God says. Well, you know, what? there's a whole bunch of prophets that weren't. There's a whole bunch of prophets that were saying, hey, everything's going to be okay. It's great. And the prophets come along and say, God does not like that because if destruction is coming, I'm going to say what's coming. And uh, so... Jesus, and remember, he said, he said, in the world, you're going to have tribulation. But be of good cheer, right? Because I've overcome. I've overcome. So, uh, 
I, I want to look at this passage, though, because Jesus, you know, a lot of times if you're looking for comfort, people want to say, well, Jesus just said to love everybody. You know what? We do. In fact, Jesus loved everybody so much that he came and gave his life so that nobody would have to perish. That includes everybody. That includes people that don't look like us, that don't live like us. The worst sinner Jesus loves. But he loves them so much that he came and gave his life so they don't have to stay a sinner. (laughs) He loves them. He just doesn't love the sin. He hates the sin because of what it does to people. Um, And so, um, when you're talking about, Jesus has very little tolerance for hypocrisy. And this is partly what I want to get to tonight. I, uh, we're calling the, I'm calling this authenticity because Jesus says it's not enough to just even call yourself a prophet to hang out with me all the time. It's very important that you become very authentic. What did he have a problem with with the religious leaders? He said you're hypocrites. You're hypocrites. <laughs> you, you spout off a, a religious, uh, you know, Holier than thou thing, all the while you aren't really living it yourself. There's there's the reality of who we are that needs to rise, and I and I I just see it as such a necessity during this time. We need to find out who we really are and be that. Amen. Like never before. And 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 I was I was encouraged in prayer. I just encourage whoever wants to join us. Uh, we've got a we've got a Zoom thing going. I I just got it started this week. We haven't announced it too much or anything. But if you'd like to, we have a a, a number you can call in, twelve noon every day. I thought we could, you know if somebody's on lunch or whatever you can join with us. Um, we we try to keep it limited to what's that? Well, uh, every day during the week, except for Friday. I have it scheduled for Friday, but we'll do it. We'll do it, uh, for right now, we'll do it Monday through Thursday. Um, and a, a part of the purpose of that for me is, you know, if we really believe in prayer, if we really be- believe prayer is doing something, it makes a difference, then we need to be praying more consistently. And I know when we prayed today, sometimes when you enter into prayer, you can, you can feel the weight of other things when you're going into. But something happens when we pray. It, it makes a difference. It, 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 it changes things. And it actually takes who you are on the inside and brings it to the outside. It, it begins to transform how you feel about things and your effectiveness. Amen? And... Um, so anyway, let me, let me go ahead and get started on this. I've got a few passages I just want to get through tonight, and, and uh, let me pray before I do, because I, I really desire for there to be something we draw out of this that's going to help us. Amen? Father, I thank you, Lord, for the, for the witness of the Holy Spirit that's in us right now, and Father, that you want to take us from a place that is very uh, easy to get into, Lord God, where we are applying our own perspectives to who you are. And Father God, we we want the real. We want who you are to be who we are, Lord God. For us not to be living a facade of uh, religious uh, concepts or ideas, Lord God, and, and miss out on really being connected with who you are. And so, Lord God, I just pray that by the Holy Spirit right now, that, God, you'll help me to say some things that are right from your heart. God, I don't want to just say stuff that's coming out of my head, but, Lord, I want to be cognizant of what you are trying to speak to us during these times right now. So we yield to you right now and welcome you to, to open our eyes, open our hearts to see what you would want us to see tonight. In Jesus' name. Amen. So, um, remember John the Baptist? Uh, it was right before uh, Jesus came and he, and he baptized him. He's preaching. And he's talking about the one that's going to come after him. He says, that, well, right now I'm baptizing you to repentance. I'm baptizing you to, to turn. He said, but the one that's coming after me, he's, he's going to baptize you with the Holy Ghost. But look what he says about this. 
First of all, he says there's going to be a change. There's going to be a winnowing. <laughs> there's going to be a winnowing fork that's going to come and separate the legitimate, the authentic from the facades. His winning, winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn. But he will burn up the shaft with unquenchable fire. Ha. Huh. So Jesus isn't all about just loving everybody and opening his arm. He is welcoming, but what's he wanting to do? He's wanting to say, I want to make the real thing out of you. You know, our Father God is so wonderful. He's provided grace that is greater than all of our sin. It will draw us into where he's at. But right now, in these end times, it's only going to be the truly authentic ones that know God that are going to survive. And right now, there's, there's a lot of pressure going on being put upon us to listen to other voices that would cause us to be more affected by what's going on in the world. Amen? Some of the pressures that are being put upon us and, and what is the driving force by all of it, and this is how you know where it's coming from. It's a fear of death, isn't it? It's a fear of death and it's strife and division in between races. Where there's strife, what is there? Every evil work abounding, right? Right? Where there's fear, there can't be faith. Neither one of them can be coming from God, can they? And so what's, what we're being tempted to do is to get caught up in that. And wh what we're listening to is never the voice of the Holy Spirit. Where the voice of the Holy Spirit is, in fact, when we lift our, our, our uh, thoughts to the things that are above, we were praying about it today, what, what the result of that is peace. That passes what we're going through, the understanding. Amen? So we can know, and, and, and so we need to be aware, we need to be aware of what's going on, but we do not need to get caught up in where our mind will be taken. Because the only thing that the enemy can do to, to remove from us this, uh, we have the real thing. We have the real thing. But the enemy wants to come and, and have our grandfather die or some, somebody's living a lifestyle that's compromising what God says about things. And now we think we have to adjust that. Now we, we put our stamp, and I'm not talking to y'all, we're talking about somebody else, but you know what I mean. We put our stamp of what God, how God sees things, and we're just supposed to embrace everybody. You know, we are supposed to love everybody, but love doesn't allow somebody to go to hell. And this is something that I, I think we should, be, we should be concerned right now. We should not be concerned about ourselves. We are secure in him. Amen? The temptation, and I'll just admit, I, mean, I hear some of these reports going on. These could be the end times. The, these could be the very, you know, things can change, but, but there, there's, there's, a, there's a plan going on to bring, and, and it's, it's coming against the church. This is a scheme, and as, I would have never thought that this, how this could come about. But, you know, even the mark of the beast and stuff, I mean, we're, <laughs> we're getting really close to not being able to buy and sell unless we got a mask on our face. What else are we going to require us to have, you know? <laughs> and so in... But we have to be careful that in the midst of this, we don't get caught up in the fear of it. Amen? Because right now, what, what we need to be concerned about, what needs to be, you, you know, I don't, I don't like, I, I grew up in a time when we would talk about having a burden, a burden in prayer. And, you know, I think we kind of have that. But it shouldn't be a burden about ourselves. Amen? We should be at peace about ourselves because God says we're safe in Him. And we'll see some verses about this. But we should be concerned about people that don't know God. That should be a burden that weighs on us. Amen? We should cry out to God for the Lord of the harvest. Send labors into the harvest field. Amen? Because the time is short. You know what else is happening? Jesus is coming. Amen? But when he's coming, who's he coming for? He's not just coming for everybody. 
It's coming for a church that's without spot or wrinkle. Amen? So, that's, that was, that was uh, John the Baptist's description of Jesus. <laughs> and Jesus' self-description is not too much different. He's, he said, I'm not about just bringing everybody together. Everybody that comes under me will be bonded in love. They will be. In fact, that's how you know if, if they're mine or not. It's how they treat each other. But he said, I'm going to turn people against each other. Do you, you see any of this going on right now? I mean, the church is getting separated against the church. There's a lot of strife going on. Why? Because there's a true dependence upon God that will not get caught up a uh, into the dependence upon a man's government or a, a, a man's way of doing things. You know, the real deception that I see right now is this security that somehow we're going to protect ourselves from a virus by some little thing that we do. You know what I mean? I haven't seen any evidence that any of this actually does anything. And yet, we're all thrust into this conforming to something. It might, it might not, but I'll tell you what, my dependence is not on that. And yet, I, I see the whole basis of it again is fear. The fear of death. Well, we need to get stripped of that completely. Jesus came to take the sting of death. We're not afraid of that at all. You know what? We're all going to die. <laughs> We're all going to die. But where are we on this side of it? I don't want to be living in fear, in bondage. Amen. So, Jesus talks about this, and this is a really comforting thought. <laughs> I have come to bring fire on the earth, and how I wish it were already kindled. Man, he, he he's can't wait for this to happen. <laughs> but I have a baptism to undergo, and what constraint I am under until it is completed. Do you think I came to bring peace on the earth? No, I tell you, but division. From now on, there will be five in one family divided against each other, three against two, and two against three. They'll be divided, father against son, and son against father, mother against daughter, and daughter against mother, Mother mother-in-law against daughter-in-law, and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. That sounds like that's just the way it always is, right? (laughs) But no. (laughs) No, I'm just kidding. All right. (laughs) That's right. She's the only one that's right. Okay. Uh, <laughs> how does that happen? Because the core of who you are will be, there, there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a, why are we called Christians? Because we have the anointed one living inside of us and there's a legitimacy that, and an authentic, authenticity that is brought to the heart of the one who really knows him that is going to have direct opposition against it. And it's inevitable. Until somebody gives their life to Christ, we are not going to just be, it's not just, what's that, what's that term? That, um, coexist. We just want to coexist as if everything is okay. You know what? There's only one God. <laughs> and we can't just say, I honor your God. Too. No, when you honor another God, you're, you're bowing yourself before them. And there's no other God that can come before our God. Amen? Only Him. Only Him. So what Jesus said, I am coming to, 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 to make this division between the, the fake and the authentic. And the, the fake is going to be burned up. He's not nice about this. Why? Because our God is a consuming fire. His holiness is without compromise. He loved us so much he gave Jesus so that we could become a new creation and have a new authentic being inside of us. Amen? But once we are born again, we still have a choice whether he's ours or not. We can let go of that and say, no, I don't really want to live with God forever. I like the world too much. So, there's a need for spiritual authenticity to discern the times. So, um, he 
he's continuing here, and he says to the crowd, so he's, he's talked about that. He said, I'm going to come, and I'm going to bring division. I'm going to bring fire. And then he starts immediately talking about when you see a cloud rising in the west, immediately you say, it's going to rain, and it does. And when the south wind blows, you say, it's going to be hot, and it is. Hypocrites. You know how to interpret the appearance of the earth and the sky. How is it that you don't know how to interpret this present time? So, he's talking about hypocrites now. And he's saying, when you are not one in spirit, when there's not an ability to see that how things really are, they didn't even see what was coming. That's why Jesus got so frustrated with these religious leaders. They didn't even know who he was. They could perceive, and you know, I was thinking about this. We aren't as good at this. Where I grew up, it was pretty much this way. Farmers could see what the weather was going to be. They could perceive what it was going to be. Uh, and, and that's kind of what he's talking to. He said, in the natural things, you're able to perceive things. But because you don't really know, you can't sense in your spirit the truth of what's going on. There, there was a reason for the law. And you know, some, there were some people that legitimately knew God through the law. Samuel. You know, there were some legitimate people that knew. And yet, it became such a business. It came, became such a, well, you were born into the Levitical, you know, lineage, so now you're going to be a priest. And it became something where it, was, it wasn't a, a matter of the heart. Jesus said it's going to be a matter of the heart now. It's not just what you do right or you do wrong. And no, what's going on in your heart? Amen? And said, you can't even, because you're not authentic, you can't even perceive what's coming right now. And, I, and I'm thinking, you know what, we, there's a necessity for us in the spirit right now if we're going to be ready for what comes, not, not taken off guard, not able to deal with it, afraid, <laughs> beat up by it. No, we need to be effective right now. Amen? Whether this is the final end or not, something's happening right now that we get, need to be smack dab in the middle of because the enemy, you know, I really believe there's an opportunity for the church to rise right now like never before, but we're not going to if we can't even see what's coming. If we're not even authentic right now. If we're actually just living a facade of re religious stuff. <laughs> Amen? This goes to worship. This goes to, to the word, even prayer. We have to be authentic. Before God. <laughs> Is this all right tonight? I think, it's, I think it's stuff we need to hear. Amen? Did I, did I skip past something? I did, didn't I? I must have bumped something. All right. The great danger is hypocrisy, and, 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 it's, and it's always fear-based. And so, um, So this is kind of interesting, and I'm thinking, why in the world does this verse start off this way? Um, it says, meanwhile, when a crowd of many thousands had gathered so that they were trampling on one another, Jesus began to speak first to his disciples, saying, be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Now, I spoke to this a little bit sooner, a, a little bit earlier. What were the, what were the, uh, what were the Pharisees, what were the religious leaders mostly concerned about? They were concerned about the people. And I think that's possibly why they included this thousands thing right before Jesus talked about this. Because what we're worried about most of the time is what the majority thinks. In fact, what, what is always going on in the news? What the majority thinks about this? What the majority thinks about that? And you think that you're, you're, you're missing it if you're not with the majority, right? So, so we have to find out what everybody else is thinking in order to find out what we should be thinking. And, and the pressure being put upon us is if you're not with the crowd, you are not legitimate. You don't even care about the crowd because you're not with the crowd, Right? And I think this flies right in the face of Jesus. He says, 
You know, there's a whole crowd around me right now pressing in upon me. And what it makes me realize is that I'm not going to listen to the crowd. I'm not going to be afraid of what anybody thinks about me. Aren't you glad Jesus didn't fall into that? You know, what he was going through was a magnitude of religious pressure like nobody has ever received. He grew up in complete alliance with the law. And now he was being, he was being law shamed. You know how they shame people now for stuff? He was being law shamed like nobody else. What he was doing according to the law was blaspheming God. Saying that he was his son. Right? And Jesus was getting pressure to let go of who he was, being authentic like nobody else has. Amen? What he was going through when he was persecuted was more internal than it was external. Sometimes, you know, if you think about it this way, he might have just been taking the bodily pain just for us. The internal stuff was what he was going through. He's taken all the shame. And you know what he did? He despised the shame because he knew what it was. He perceived what it was. <laughs> Amen? He despised that shame. And because of that, he was able to not just be a facade. Amen? <laughs> so he, he, he begins to address his disciples. He says, be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees which is hypocrisy. What, what is it about yeast? You don't really see that it's there when it first goes in. But it has, it has a, a spreading effect, and it affects the whole thing, right? Now, he uses yeast in other areas, but he's talking about hypocrisy right now. And the hypocrisy, any hypocrisy that we have is a struggle between uh, what we're fearing in one area and what we really want to do in another area. So a lot of times we want to, uh, even in, in religious ways, what are we, why are we even acting religious? Because we're, we feel like we have to cover those bases too. It's all fear-driven, right? He said, but you have to be careful that you don't get caught up in being something just because you feel pressure to be that way whether it's religious or not religious, and being authentic because Jesus hated that. He could read right through it, couldn't he? He could see. Remember what? He, he healed a man on the Sabbath day, and he's getting accused of this uh, by, by these religious leaders. He's being law-shamed, and he, and he says, I see who you are. You put on this religious facade, and then if your ox falls in the... In the, in the uh, in the ditch, on the Sabbath, you're going to take care of that. Why? Because you're not really authentic. You're not real. Amen? He said, but there is nothing concealed that will not be disclosed. Or hidden that will not be made known. This is why it's so important. Anything... And we, I think we need the help of the Holy Spirit with this. God, don't let me just be a facade. Let me be real. Because anything that we're hiding, it's going to get revealed anyway in one way or another, isn't it? Amen? Especially in, the, in these times. We're going to have to have some backbone based upon authenticity. Rather than just something we've said in the past. Or some sermon that we've heard. No, to stand up and not worry about what anybody else thinks. That's what we've been called to. Amen? What have you said? Uh, what you have said in the dark will be heard in the daylight, and what you have whispered in the ear in the inner rooms will be proclaimed from the roofs. I tell you, my friends, who's he talking to? He's talking to his disciples, isn't he? This might not be something that he would say to the throngs, but he's saying it to those who he needs to be authentic. Surely this came back to Peter later on when he betrayed. I tell you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body 
and after that can do no more. Isn't this amazing thing that he says here? We're not supposed to be moved by fear of any of those things, are we? God, help us. Help us to get past any facades, amen? But I will show you whom you should fear. Fear him who, after your body has been killed, has authority to throw you into hell. Now, the world does not want to hear that anybody's going to hell. In fact, that's the, that's, the, that's the separation that Jesus came to say. Amen? Jesus came to give, make it so that nobody could, would perish, would have to perish. Amen? That implies that somebody's going to perish. That perishing is an inevitability without Jesus. Amen? But that's an offense to somebody that knows somebody that's perishing and doesn't really love them because they don't want to inform them that they're perishing. Right? Is this true? Why do we preach? Why do we preach the gospel? Shouldn't have to if everybody's not, if if some people aren't going to hell. Now, Jesus said, I'm coming to make it so that people don't have to go to hell. But there's going to be opposition. And he said, the way that's going to heaven is very small. Don't you know that that, that just grieved his heart? <laughs> he said, I want everybody to, to go to heaven. He said, fear who? Fear God. What we, what we need to have is a healthy fear of what's going to happen if we're not authentic. I think we should be afraid of that. Amen? What you fail to fear, you fail to be affected by. Amen? What you fail to fear, you fail to be affected by. Right? (laughs) I've acquired this healthy fear of car wrecks. Do you ever do that? Do you ever think, have this vision of you like running into a truck or something, you know, and it's like, I'm not going to do that. I'm, I'm going to be, actually, I was, I, was, I was turning left off of New Hope today. And you know how the, when the, the light turns yellow, and I've had a wreck this way before. It wasn't in these this exact circumstances, but there was a car coming, and um, I was the last one that was going to turn left, you know, after, when it's yellow. And this truck went by. And it was concealing my vision of another car that was behind him at an angle. And I went to turn left because I'm feeling, you know, you feel the pressure to get around there before everybody else is coming. And, and that car's right there, right in front of me all of a sudden, you know, <laughs> that I hadn't seen. And uh, healthy fear went through my, my body at that moment. I'm thinking, Phew. next time I'm going to be a little bit more careful about that. No, I was not on my phone. I was being very, and I thought I was being very careful. But you know how things happen. Um, I won't tell you too many more stories because I don't want to alter your high impression of me. But (laughs) but what happens when we encounter those kinds of things is it should affect us the next time we go through something similar, right? Right? But with God, if we don't ever really see him as this holy fire, if we don't see him as as there's a consequence of me not being authentic, he goes into this in a lot of different ways. He talks about the the, the, the virgins, you know, with their with their lamps being ready. Why? Because those are the authentic ones. Are we ready? Are we even caring? You know? <laughs> I know we are, but let's just, man, let's hit this a little bit, okay? Is this all right? Okay, so the times, and, and there is an antichrist. Do you sense that at all? And I, you know, I spoke about this just a little bit already, but what is antichrist? There's a lot of things you could talk about, but the big thing that, that I see is just this dependence upon somebody besides God for our security. Amen? And giving in to to. to hate and to 
You know, I talked about this a few weeks about the hijacking of truth where you take one truth and you say, okay, because that's true, now I can do something else. That's antichrist. It's not, it's not Christ. The world and its desires pass away. So what do we just say? We should fear the one that after we pass away can neither throw us or can throw us into hell. God's going to do that. He's uncompromising. But the world and its desires will pass away. Everything that we see around us right now that could cause us to fear, it's all going to pass away. But whoever does the will of God lives forever. Dear children, this is the last hour. And as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come. This is how we know it is the last hour. Now, there were some different things back in those times. You know, if you study it, there were actually people that presented themselves as the Messiah. There was a lot of other alternatives back then that were saying that they were the Messiah. But nobody had the, the signs and the wonders like Jesus. Nobody was raised from the grave. Nobody fulfilled all those promise, uh, prophecies, right? But he says there's going to be a, a, a reliance upon somebody else as the... We don't relate to a Messiah as much as, as like the, the Jewish people did. They, set, they saw him as their salvation. They saw him as their answer. How would that relate to us today? Well, when we're seeing anything else as our salvation. Because we can be drawn into that, can't we? So, it's prevalent around us. It's strong around us. You know, we even prayed about our, our pastors. I think our pastors are being really pushed to give in to this dependence upon something else as their security. Uh, so I would think that, yes, this is the end times. You know, uh, I, I saw a commentary on this. This was written way back then, and yet the beginning of the end was already beginning. <laughs> and, you know, the end comes for anybody that succumbs to this kind of description anyway. Right? It might, it might be extended. Uh, the reason why I say this is, is Mimi knows this, and uh, you guys know it too. I'm us older ones. I had a 58-year-old guy come by. Tom came by and talked to me today, and he was talking about how different things were back in the 70s. And, and, uh, and you know what? We had some good songs. It won't be long. Dill will be leaving here. We were expecting Jesus continually back then. And you know, it's this many years later. He hasn't come yet, but you know what? It's still the end times. There's still an anti-Christ that we need to be perceptive of. And how are we going to be perceptive when we're not caught up in hypocrisy, not being authentic? Amen? 2 Thessalonians 2, 3 through 4, talks about this Antichrist some more. Don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for that day will not come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the man doomed to destruction. He will oppose and will exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worshipped, so that he sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. Now, there's an individual that's going to come. And, and, you know, the thing that was different back in the 70s is it, the, the world wasn't set up so much for this as it is right now. I mean, the world's getting set up for this big time. The whole world's bowing down to, to uh, all the constraints. And it's almost like even in America right now, do you, do you sense the reduction of the power of the presidency even? It's like they're saying, well, you can't, you have to do certain things, right? And it's, if there was ever a setting up for it, it would indicate that it is taking place right now. And we will know for sure if we're living in, in, a, in the realm of authenticity, authenticity, right? Well, we're really knowing our God. This is why I've been preaching on this I don't know if you remember, but we got started on this right after the, the pandemic started, talking about knowing God. 
acknowledging God in everything that we're doing. Amen? Because we will be among those. Every, all this other stuff's going to pass away. And, and we are going to be sustained. But as long as we're keeping our, our oils filled, our lamps filled with oil, amen? As long as we're knowing our God. The times, Jesus is coming. Luke 12, 35 through 40. Be dressed, ready for service, and keep your lamps burning. Like servants waiting for the master to return from a wedding banquet. So that when he comes and knocks, they can immediately open the door for him. When Jesus comes, actually, you know what? We could die at, at any moment. Now, this isn't a very good faith statement, isn't it? Is it? With a long life, I will satisfy him and, and show him my, my blessings, you know. Um, but if we, were, if we were to die going out of the driveway today, it wouldn't be that far from if we were to live a full extended life. At any point, though, will, will we be ready for having Jesus say either well done or I don't know you? Amen? It needs to be something that, that we, man, my life is about being authentic before God. And these are the times to be stirred in this way. If there's going to be a revival in the church, it's going to be a revival of authenticity. Amen? It will be good for those servants whose master finds them watching when he comes. It will be good for them. Truly, I tell you, he will dress himself to serve. Isn't this interesting? God's actually going to serve us. We'll have them recline at the table and we'll come and wait on them. It will be good for those servants whose master finds them ready. Even he, if he comes in the middle of the night or towards daybreak. But understand this. If the owner of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have let his house be broken into. Now, I was... It seems to me like a, a, an odd analogy. I don't know if you've thought about this before, but he's talking about Jesus coming as being a thief in the night. And um, I was running this past my wife, and she said, well, I don't know about that, but what, what, is, it, what is it about a thief when they come in? They're gonna, they're, it's going to be a negative thing, isn't it? It's, it's not going to be a good thing if you're not ready. That's where the, the connection, I think, could be is, you know what? If we're not ready for Jesus, it's not going to be a good thing because he's coming anyway. He's coming anyway. You all also must be ready because the Son of Man will come in an hour when you do not expect him. So what would that impose upon us? Expectancy Always. Amen? Because it's in the hour that we're not expecting. It's in, that, it's in that time when you don't think that car's where you, it really is that you run into that car, right? So you come, become vigilant all the time. And you, and you say, no, I'm going to be the one that's ready for the master. Amen? All right, just a little bit more. Are we good? This is good stuff, isn't it? 1 Thessalonians 5 1 through 11. Now, brothers and sisters, about the times. So what I'm talking about times here, remember Jesus said you can't even perceive the times because you're not authentic. Let's be, let's be authentic, amen? Now, brothers and sisters, about times and dates, we do not need to write to you, for you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. Huh. While people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come on them suddenly. Why are they saying peace and safety? Because their peace and safety relies upon something other than him. Amen? As labor pains on a pregnant woman, they will not escape. But you, brothers and sisters, are not in darkness. And this is the comfort that we should take. Amen? We should be encouraged in this. 
You are not in darkness so that this day should surprise you like a thief. But how important is, is it for us to not be in the darkness? What is the darkness? The world. Love of the world. Being affected by the world. Being impressed by the world. Being in fear because of the world. It's all darkness, isn't it? It says, you are not in darkness so that this day should surprise you like a thief. You are all children of the light and children of the day. We do not belong to the night or to the darkness. So then, let us not be like others. There should be a difference. Amen? There should be a bounce in our step. There should be a confidence on our face. There should not be a fear. Amen? We should look different in the eyes. You know how you, you, you can tell if, something, if someone's in fear, can't you? You can see it in their eyes. You can see if somebody, you can tell if somebody's at peace. There, it, it affects your glory. It affects who you are. It reveals whether you're authentic or not, doesn't it? Amen? You are all children of the light and children of, uh, and children of the day. We do not belong to the night or to the darkness. So then let us not be like others who are asleep, but let us be awake and sober. It's interesting he's using this asleep and awake stuff here a little bit because he goes on to talk about this actually being asleep is being asleep to the world. What is being asleep to the world? Dead. So there's, he says... uh, Those in the world that are dead to God, he said, don't be like them. Be those who are alive, awake. So when he's saying asleep and and awake, it's a reference to being alive or dead. Right? So don't be like those who are dead to God. But be awake. And not just awake, but sober. What is sober? Sober. Aware, perceptive, because of the intensity of your awakeness, awakeness to God. Amen? For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk, get drunk at night. Those who sleep, they're dead to God, they they, they, are, they are dead at the very time that they need to be awake unto God. Those who get drunk, get drunk at night. What, they're getting drunk with the world. They're getting, they're getting full, intoxicated. What, what, what is it about somebody that's intoxicated? You know, she referred to me being on my phone at the intersection. What's worse than being on your phone? Being intoxicated at the intersection, all right? Big portion of the wrecks that take place are somebody that's intoxicated. Why? Because they're not ready for what's happening. You get intoxicated with the world. It's not just alcohol. It's anything. But you're getting intoxicated with the world. You don't even see what's coming. Amen? <laughs> because you're getting drunk in the, in the very time that you should be awake and your light being kept. Amen? But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, putting on faith and love as a breastplate and the hope of salvation as a helmet. What is that doing? It's keeping our minds. Faith and love is keeping our heart in the right place. We're not getting caught up in strife. We're not getting caught up in in hatred. We're not even getting caught up. My wife keeps saying, don't listen to the news. You know what? We don't need to listen to the news. We can become aware of what's going on, but we don't need to get caught up in the battle. The battle's won in the Lord. We just stand in prayer and in the word. Amen? For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, that, that kind of hit me funny. I'm thinking, uh, but in the you're, you're talking about suffering. He's not talking about the wrath of the world. He's talking about the wrath of God. God did it. He didn't appoint us to to be asleep at the very time that Jesus is coming back. What what happens to those people? 
They suffer wrath. They suffer the wrath of God. God said, I don't want that. I, I want there for there to be salvation through the Lord Jesus Christ. He died for us so that whether we are awake, and this is where it gets a little confusing, but now he's just talking about alive on this earth, physically alive on this earth, or asleep on this earth when Jesus comes. Because there's people that are already dead on this earth, right? Whether we're alive or dead, when Jesus comes, we'll live together with him. Amen? Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up just as, in fact, you are doing. So, this is important tonight what we're talking about, isn't it? This is a building each other up. But you know what? It's, it doesn't do any good to pat. Patting somebody on the back does not build them up if they're in peril. Amen? You know what builds them up is to say, you know what? You should really become authentic before God. You should let go of the world. You should let go of being intoxicated. And you know, some of the best thing you can do for that is to be that yourself. You know what, some of the best things, and we are doing this tonight, y'all are wonderful, but the, again, I was talking with Tom, he says, you know what, the, you can tell uh, when somebody's not authentic, he didn't use the word authentic, but he's talking about a used car salesman. He said, you know that they're not liking you because they like you. They like you because they want something from you, Right? They're not being authentic. Jesus, uh, uh, or, or no, it's Proverbs, right, that says, uh, uh, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. It's who you are authentically that you are able to influence with. If we're going to build each other up, one of the best ways to build somebody else up is to become authentic yourself. People can smell authenticity, can't they? They can tell if it's true. And you know what? The truly authentic will be a magnet. It's like that scripture that uh, I love. You know, it says, uh, thanks be unto God who always causes us. He's always, it's always his, his purpose to cause us to triumph in what? Being real. Being real because the real are the triumphant. And when you are, you become a smell of God that builds somebody else up and makes them say, oh, that's how it can be. Amen? And then when you need to, to speak the word too, you're not afraid of what somebody's going to say or what they're thinking about you because you're more consumed with where they're going. Amen? We need to build each other up. We should need to not be afraid. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up just as, in fact, you are doing. Amen? He says, I know you're doing this already, but let's be encouraged in this. Amen? All right. Oh, that didn't mean to go there. Let me, uh, let me just go back real quick. Yeah. Praise God. So wh what are we going to be? We're going to be authentic. Amen? What are we going to fear? Nobody. But that the, the God. We're going to fear the God who, if people don't choose Jesus, they are going to hell. Amen? And now our hearts are joined with God, with Jesus. We want to do everything we can do to be authentic ourselves so that when we share, we're not just used car salesmen trying to pitch something we don't have ourselves. Amen? But it's the real thing. We have to be authentic. We have to be sold out. You know, there was a term we had growing up, being on fire for God. Being on fire. Really believing what we're talking about. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you. Thank you for your word. Lord, I thank you that Jesus didn't uh, sugarcoat anything. <laughs> he didn't just preach a gospel that the world wants to hear. He preached one that would save them. And so, Lord God, I, I thank you that this is the gospel that we've embraced. This is the gospel that we know. I, I liked how this, this passage was just saying, it said, as you are already doing. And, 
Lord, I thank you that we can be encouraged and, and, and uh, built up in what you've called us to be, Lord God. But Lord, I, I just pray that you would help us to be sensitive to the moving of the Spirit as you, as you cause us to make adjustments in our life also. God, that the world would not intoxicate us and, and the world would not uh, inflict its fear and its trepidation upon us, Lord God. And any time, Lord, that God, we, we start to, to feel that coming upon us, that we just run to the throne of grace. Lord God, that we don't take on any of those, any of those fears, any of those worries, Lord God, but we just take them before you. And we get our face right back in the face of our God who lifts up our thoughts and is the lifter of our head and surrounds our head with a helmet of salvation, Lord God, we are, where we are kept. Hallelujah. And our hearts are kept in love. Hallelujah. God, I just pray that over each one of us tonight. Father, we are, we are going deeper into the trueness of life, that eternal life that will transcend everything else around us that is going to perish, Lord God. We are among those who will be sustained through eternity with our Father God. Hallelujah. We're the real deal. We're the children of light. We're not the children of darkness. We're awake unto you. We're anticipating you. We're in preparation for you. Hallelujah. We're the one you're coming for. We're the ones you know, Lord God. Hallelujah. You know us because we're always in your face. We know You know us because we're always speaking your word. Hallelujah. You know us because we're always responding to your call to triumph, to be victorious over this world, Lord God. Hallelujah. That's who we are. We're your children, Lord. Thank you for taking us to a greater and a higher level of authenticity in the presence of our God. We worship you. We thank you for the privilege of living in these times, Lord God, where you've called us to live above them. You've seated us in heavenly places above them, far above principalities and powers. Hallelujah. In a place of victory, in a place of authority. Lord, we affect the world around us. We're not impressed by it at all. There's more that are with us than are against them. Hallelujah. We are in the majority. Possibly not on this earth. Oh, but we have a throng. We have a throng of angels that are with us. Oh, they encamp around us. They keep us in all of our ways. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, we are not beneath. We have been set above. Hallelujah. More than conquerors in every situation. We give you thanks for that, Father. Hallelujah. 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 God, we embrace the change. We embrace that fire, Lord God. We determine to be those who are on fire. Hallelujah. That fear our God and have no fear for anything else. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.